Oh, you heard the background, huh? Okay. Welcome, everyone. Welcome. Okay, folks, let's try it again. Second time around. As is our habit, we wait for a few minutes until enough people show up. And then we begin in prayer, and then we trust the Holy Spirit to guide. Welcome, everyone. Everyone, help me to also welcome our dear guest, and he's welcome to come here anytime. You see this young man named Kareem. You see that young man? I just want you guys to keep praying for this young man. Although he's from a Muslim background, he's very kind, respectful, and he's open to allowing the, the, the true God, the Spirit, to guide him into all truth. So pray for him. Love on him. If he asks any tough questions, don't get defensive. He's not asking to attack. But do pray for him because he's young. He's a handsome, young 19-year-old who is aching for God and thirsting for God. So be kind with him, all right? I'm ready for the back of my eyes. Okay. So just, just with that said, I just want to remind you of some rules. And people will hear that when they, if they come in later, when they go back and listen from the start. Here are some rules to help me to help you. You guys know I don't mind people coming in and asking even tough questions. And if I can get to them, I will. But here's what I don't want. In order to help me to help you, in order to glorify Jesus Christ, in order to honor Jesus Christ and not grieve the Holy Spirit, <clears throat> I do not permit people coming into my <clears throat> comment section, attacking, ridiculing, mocking, blaspheming, insulting the triune God, his word, the Bible, or brothers and sisters in Christ. If you do that, I'm going to insult you and ridicule you, humiliate you, and ban you. So those are my rules. That's, that's first and foremost. Secondly, I don't want people to be, quote, unquote, pontificating, meaning coming in here, preaching their own message, promoting their own agenda, and pretty much ignoring the discussion and being a distraction to the people listening. Okay, that's two. Third, I don't want people to be engaging in side discussions, in side debates, because you're here because you want to learn a particular perspective. I don't mind that you don't agree with me. Honestly, by the grace of God, if you disagree with me, that's fine, because I don't have perfect knowledge of the scriptures. My trust, my hope is that the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit of the living God, will show me where I'm wrong, correct me, give me the grace to be humble enough to admit I'm wrong and not to repeat those errors, and then give me the power and give us the power to then live the truth of the Bible perfectly so that we can live for the glory of the trying God, the Father, His Son, the Lord Jesus, Holy Spirit, because we cannot love Jesus enough and live for Him enough. We need to do more. So that you want to disagree, and that's okay. What I ask you to do is, before you think I'm wrong, hear my case. Go back and re-listen to the sessions. Go back and read these passages in their context. And ask the Holy Spirit, you are my God, my Lord, the perfect teacher. You guide and preserve me. Show me where he's wrong and save me from all error and guide me into all truth. Is that reasonable? Because this is not a debate channel. If you want to debate me, we can set up a debate. This is a session where I'm trusting the Holy Spirit to use me for the glory of Jesus to bless you and trust the Holy Spirit to guide us into all truth and save you from all errors on my part and strengthen you in the truth that he enables me to share and then show me where I'm wrong and then give us the power to live the word of God and love the word of God and proclaim the word of God and even die for the word of God, the Holy Bible, because it's the voice of God, right? I think those are reasonable. I don't think I'm asking too much. And hopefully, and again, if you wonder why I keep asking for numbers, may God sanctify my heart, purify my heart, not to do it for the praise of men, never to prostitute myself for fame or fortune. May sanctify me. But I do want to see a lot more Christians coming to these sessions and learning this stuff and promoting it for the glory of the triune God. That's why. So hopefully we're going to outdo Hater Wood, who puts us to sleep. He's a cure to insomnia. So hopefully, let's see. Maybe we'll get close to 200 in Jesus' name.
Yeah, Ra Rajo, I wasn't in the mood for you for yesterday, brother. It was better that I just took a day. Shamir, you wouldn't find the second line for you because I didn't do it. Because I felt it was better. I just waited another day because it was pretty ridiculous last, last night, right? Getting into the debate about the flat earth and the sphere, which we're not going to talk about. Silly stuff. Instead of talking about the weightier issues, the meteor issues, the, the doctrines that matter, right? We talk about insignificant issues that are not salvific. If I believe the earth is flat and it's not, but I'm trusting in Jesus Christ, I'm going to heaven, right? But if I believe the earth is a sphere, and it is, and I reject Jesus, I'm going to hell, right? Okay, so with that said, we'll wait a few more minutes. As we wait, let's pray. The internet connection, again, I've turned off the Wi-Fi. I'm connecting, connecting directly to the modem. So thank the brothers and sisters for your advice to get an Ethernet cable, which came with the box with the modem and router. The connection has been superb. It does buffer once in a while, but it's very brief. So glory to the triumph God for all his blessings, his graces, his mercy, his love, his compassion, his provisions, none of which we deserve. Even good internet connection is a grace of the triumph God. There are people living in certain countries that don't have access to the internet. So even this is a blessing if you use it lawfully. If you use the internet for the glory of Jesus, to learn about Jesus, to preach Jesus, to love Jesus, not for sin. May God forgive us when we do and protect us from doing it. That's a blessing, right? Because there are people who do not have access to the internet and do not have access to these resources, who do not have access to these Bible programs that you have access to for free. They can't click on BibleHub.com. They can't get BibleGateway.com. So we're being spoiled and we take it for granted. That's why someone mocked me. Ah, oh, you're praying even for the internet. Ah, yeah. You wouldn't be laughing if you're living in a remote jungle somewhere and you don't have access. Thank you guys for your love and support. Thank you. So we love you, Father. We love you, Lord Jesus. And we love you, Holy Spirit. Father, I ask again for a powerful anointing from your Holy Spirit. Anoint me, Father, by the power of the Holy Spirit to speak truth without error. Save me from stammering. Save me from confusion. And enable me by your spirit with wisdom and knowledge and power and life from your Holy Spirit to interpret scriptures correctly, to bless your people who are gathered, Father, your church, the, the household of the living God, purchased by the blood of your Son, the Lord Jesus, your heart, who became flesh from the Virgin Mary by the power of the Holy Spirit. Father, purify us and our loved ones, my daughters, in the blood of Jesus Christ. Cleanse us in the blood of Jesus Christ, even our loved ones, my daughters, Wash us in the blood of the Lamb, the Lord Jesus, and make us pure and holy in your sight by the power of your living spirit, Father. And Father, have your Holy Spirit take over this session and fill me with the breath of life, life, Father. My lungs, my chest, my throat, Father. The health I need to do this and the holiness I need to delight your heart. Loosen my tongue, protect me from stammering, and bless them, Father. Bless them with eyes to see and ears to hear. And I say a, a specific prayer for Kareem, who's joined us. Father, this young man is hungry for the true God. He's hungry for a heavenly father. And he's hungry for a savior who's in love with him. Father, please save him from the shackles of Satan. Destroy the shackles of Satan. Set him free by your almighty spirit, the spirit of life. And give him eyes to see and ears to hear. To know the true Jesus and fall in love with the true Jesus. And cleave to the true Jesus. Deliver him. And wash him in the blood of the Lamb, the Lord Jesus. Please, Father, he needs a heavenly Father, as we all do. And a wonderful Savior. And the Spirit of the living God to seal us and fill us, Father. Have mercy on him, Lord. And please, Father, please provide for our daily needs, our daily bread. Do not allow us to prostitute ourselves for fame or fortune. To betray the gospel for temporary luxury, Father. But to endure by the strength of your Spirit. And to love you and live for you and obey you and worship you. And if necessary, die for you because you are worthy, O God. And death is but a door that we enter your presence until Jesus returns in glory to the earth. Have your way with us, Father. Have your way with us, Son of God. Have your way with us, Holy Spirit. And Lord, destroy all distractions of the enemy and surround us with a wall of fire from Holy Spirit. Please, Lord, I need you. I need you not just to teach. I need you to live. 
I need you to breathe. I need you to love you. We all do. They need you, Lord. Bless them. Bless them, Lord. And bring them, Lord. Bring them. Increase this for your glory. We need you, Father. We need you, Lord Jesus. We need you, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' almighty name, Yahweh, Father, Son, and Spirit. In Jesus' name. In the name of the Father and of the Son of the Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name, Yahovah, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Yahovah Rapha, Yahovah Rapha, Yahovah Rapha. I mean, okay. Just want to share some stuff with you before we begin. Amen. And I'm growing, he loves you too. Just want to show you a book again that breaks my heart. Okay. Word Biblical Commentary. Volume 30 in a series. It's a series of biblical commentaries, exposition, published by Zondervan Academic. Okay, let me go on my rant for a few minutes. I promise it'll be brief. Zondervan Academic, that's Zondervan Publishing Company, which claims to be an evangelical Christian publishing company. And if you claim to be evangelical, that means you believe in the inspiration infallibility of the holy bible and you're supposed to affirm traditional conservative views of biblical authorship this is a commentary on the book of daniel guys i need you to listen medic don't worry about that right now brother obviously i'm here i'm okay let's focus on jesus right uh, focus on jesus thank you guys for your contributions may the lord bless you for that okay this is a commentary on daniel i've been reading through it Remember, Zondervan Academic, supposed to be an evangelical publishing company. The scholar, Go John Golden Gay, who is writing this commentary, is a liberal. He doesn't believe the Bible is inspired in Aaron. He believes the Bible has mistakes and errors. And he doesn't believe Daniel wrote the book of Daniel. So for the life of me, why does a publishing company that claims to be evangelical hire a liberal scholar to write a commentary on Daniel where if someone doesn't know the presuppositions of liberal scholarship will read this uncritically thinking Daniel did not write Daniel it's a second century BC document and it's full of errors and mistakes to destroy a person's faith now why then do I get it let me tell you why I need to be reading these commentaries to know what the liberals are saying and find answers to refute their lies and distortion of Scripture and also quote them when they make a point that confirms the truth of Christianity. Okay, so this is why I got it. And I thank the Lord Jesus for putting your arts to support the ministry. This comes from the support. I don't have a money tree. I'm not rich. And I believe God has called me into ministry. So thank you for partnering with me that I have to read through commentaries like this. Whew. But now I'm going to recommend two outstanding scholars, one who went to be with the Lord Jesus Christ, that demolishes the liberal, critical approach to the books of the Bible. John Golden Gate. Let me share this. This is a fact. Liberal scholars rarely, if at all, interact with the responses, the refutations of conservative scholars because they either think that conservative scholars are not on their level and therefore it's a waste of their time or they're not aware of the evidence that refutes their assumptions about scholarship, okay? However, conservative scholars who truly believe in the Bible's historicity are studying the liberals, interacting with their claims, and I dare say not just refuting them, utterly decimating their arguments, their claims, exposing the misinformation and the facts that they're either ignorant of or hiding. And you'll see that even with the Exodus, the series of documentaries that came out, Patterns of Evidence. Go watch the documentaries. See how much historical archaeological evidence is there that conservative scholars and even some liberals are aware of, but the other side either ignores or are not aware of, so that if you just study liberals, you'll be misled and deceived from the truth. So now... It's patterns of evidence. It will show you the amazing amount of historical, archaeological, textual evidence showing the exodus of Moses is a fact of history because our God is real and the Bible is historically accurate. But now, let me give you two book recommendations for any one of you 
who are serious about refuting liberal scholarly attacks on the authorship of the Bible, you must have these two books in your library. Here it goes. This is one of the best commentaries on the book of Daniel by a conservative Christian named Stephen R. Miller. Here's the link. Stephen R. Miller. His section on authorship, brothers and sisters, one of the most amazing, not refutation, decimation, annihilation of the liberal claims that Daniel could not have written the book of Daniel. The massive amount of historical, archaeological, textual evidence that he pre presents leaves no doubt that the book of Daniel was written by the prophet Daniel in 6th century B.C. It is a decimation. I read it. Not just a refutation, a decimation of the claims of these liberals. Okay, that's Stephen R. Miller. Yeah, it is. It's a decimation. I'll tell you when someone's response is weak. Mike, when I think a response is weak, I'll say it's weak. This was a decimation. Another decimation. Now, this man went to be with the Lord Jesus years ago. His name was Dr. Gleason L. Archer. Dr. Gleason L. Archer. He was a professor emeritus, emeritus of Trinity Evangelical Divinity School in Deerfield, Illinois. Here's this. It's a survey of the Old Testament. Okay? Survey of the Old Testament. Let me tell you what an amazing man of God is. And by the way, he debated Muslims. You can find his debates online. If you go on YouTube, you do Gleason Archer Islam. He's debated Muslims in panel discussions. He also debated on the John Ankerberg show, which was a big show, an apologetic show, hosted by a Christian evangelical named John Ankerberg. So Gleason L. Archer put in Islam. You'll see his debates are online against Muslim scholars. Now, sadly, Mike, here's where my honesty kicks in. He wasn't the best debater. And he wasn't the most charismatic speaker. He was a very slow, methodical speaker that if you're not really hungry for the truth, he can put you to sleep. Much better than David Wood can. Right? David was boring, but this guy was on another level. But if you don't care about rhetoric and you don't care about style, wealth of information. And then sadly, he didn't do good in debates. He was not a debater. But get his survey of the Old Testament. As a writer, as an author, amazing. This book, this survey, he goes throughout the, the different books of the Bible and he presents the historical, textual, archaeological evidence, evidence for the authorship of the books of the Bible. He shows you how we can know internally and externally Moses wrote the Pentateuch. And the evidence showing Daniel wrote Daniel. That the men whom the church believed wrote these books, they wrote those books because the evidence of history, of archaeology, and the textual evidence shows they are the authors. And let me tell you how amazing of a man of God he is. You want to know how amazing of a man of God he is? The man used to read and write 25 languages. He was also able to read and write in Sanskrit, the ancient Indian language. He used to read and write 25 languages, guys. Okay. Let me give you the link again. You must get this. All serious students of the Bible, apologists, get this survey of the Old Testament. And guess what else he produced? He produced a classic called the Encyclopedia of Bible Difficulties. A book-length response to alleged Bible contradictions. Let me get you the link to that. In fact, I believe you can actually get it online for free as a PDF file. Gleason Archer, Encyclopedia of Bible Difficulties. I think it's now online for free as a PDF file. Let me give you the latest word. There you go. So aren't you thankful? This again shows you that the triune God is real. The triune God lives. Yeah, it's a long URL. My goodness, I can't post it. All right. Anyway, go on Amazon. It won't let me. It's 252 characters. Here's another sign that the triune God lives. The triune God is real. Because notice, as Satan raises up his scholars to attack, God then equips and raises up his soldiers to destroy the attacks against the Bible. Is that a coincidence? 
Is that a coincidence? Is it a coincidence? You have liberals, atheists, agnostics trying to destroy the scriptures. And then you have the soldiers of God, right? Using the same sciences, whether history, archaeology, the textual transmission of the Bible, science to decimate and destroy these attacks on the Bible. So get his encyclopedia of Bible difficulties. I can't post the link here. Let me see. I don't, yeah, I'm going to have to. Yeah, let me see if I can. Because it's too long. See, it's still too long. Yeah, it's too, it's too long, folks. I can't do it. It won't let me. All right, sorry. Someone can find it, find it. So with that said, in Jesus' name, we're ready to begin. Yep, that's the one. Okay. Exactly. Air Church said something beautiful. Liberals are knocking Daniel because it has bullet for prophecy Messiah that Jesus will Not only that. You know why liberals cannot accept that Daniel wrote in the 6th century B.C.? Do you know why? Because Daniel supernaturally, accurately foretells over 500 years of human history and accurately foretells each success, successive empire and also mentions the fact that the kingdom of Alexander of Macedonia will be broken into four Horns and history attests when Alexander died, his four generals divided his empire. All of that written in Daniel before Alexander was even born, and they can't accept it. They can't accept that. Impossible. Can't happen. He even accurately tells you which kingdom succeeds the one before, and then accurately mentions the wars between Ant Antiochus and Syria with with the the Ptolemies of Egypt. How could he have known that? They'll say impossible. Yes, humanly, it is impossible. But because God is real almighty and the creator of heavens and earth and the Lord of history, he can tell someone the future before it unfolds because God is the God of the present, the future, and the past. All of it is in his hands. But if you've made up your mind, God doesn't do that or God doesn't exist, you're going to have to explain Daniel away. Right? What's up, LD? Yep. Yeah, right, Radic. Daniel and Isaiah are some of the most amazing Bible books because not only do they tell you hundreds, in fact, thousands of years of human history before it unfolds, it even mentions the names of specific kings that would be humanly impossible for the prophet to know. I'll give you an example from Isaiah. Isaiah 45, verse 1. In fact, let's read Isaiah 44, verse 28, and Isaiah 45, verse 1. Isaiah 44, verse 28, and Isaiah 45, verse 1. Amen, Abdul Halij. He is. He's amazing. Isaiah 44, 28, and Isaiah 45, verse 1. That saith of Cyrus, guys, pay attention to the name, Cyrus. That saith of Cyrus, he, he is my shepherd. God says of Cyrus, he is my shepherd. And shall perform all my pleasure, even saying to Jerusalem, Thou shalt be built, and to the temple thy foundation shall be laid. So Cyrus is going to give the order, rebuild Jerusalem and the temple. Isaiah 45, verse 1. Thus said Jehovah the Lord to his anointed, Shicho, to Cyrus, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have holden, to subdue nations before him, and I will loose the loins of kings, to open before him the two leaved gates, and the gates shall not be shut. Now, let me explain to you why this is amazing. Daniel, I'm sorry, Isaiah's writing around 700 years before the birth of Jesus Christ. 700 years, 8th century BC. History attests that the leader of the Medes Persian kingdom that destroyed Babylon was Cyrus. But guess when Cyrus destroyed Babylon? 539 BC. Daniel is writing about a king about 200 years before the king came to power. How in the world did Isaiah, I said Daniel again, Lord Jesus, loosen my tongue and save me from error. How in the world did Isaiah know the specific name of the specific king that would destroy the Babylonians and set the Jews free and commission them to rebuild Jerusalem and the temple, mentions them by name when he's writing about 200 years before the king came to power. 
Now let's go to Ezra chapter 1. Let's read verses 1 and down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Your Bible is supernatural. Post the first four verses for me, Protestant. Uh, Ezra chapter 1. Ezra chapter 1. Verses 1 down. Yeah, oh, yeah. Come on, guys. That's why I got to eat up your Bible. Your Bible is supernatural. Now, Ezra's writing after Cyrus came to power, after he gave the decree to send the Jews back. Look who sends the Jews back after destroying Babylon and setting them free from Babylonian captivity. Now, in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, whoa, that the word of Jehovah by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled. Jehovah stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia. Now, watch this, guys. What did Jehovah have Cyrus do? What did Jehovah have Cyrus do? Let's read. <clears throat> King of Persia, that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and put it also in writing, saying, Thus saith Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord God, Jehovah God of heaven, hath given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he hath charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Who is there among you of all his people? His God be with him, and let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and build a house of Jehovah. Okay? And whosoever remaineth any place where he sojourneth, let the man of his place help him with silver and with gold and with goods. And with the beast beside the free will offering for the house of God that in Jerusalem. Now let's read Isaiah 44, 28 one more time. Isaiah 44, 28 one more time. So you guys can be blown away. Nearly 200 years before Cyrus, the king of Persia, Destroyed Babylon and set the Jews free and told them, go and rebuild the temple and Jerusalem. Isaiah already mentioned him by name and said what he would do. That saith of Cyrus, he is my shepherd and shall perform all my pleasure, even saying to Jerusalem, thou shalt be built and to the temple, thy foundation shall be laid. How in the world could Isaiah know about 200 years beforehand the king who would destroy the Babylonians and set the Jews free and send them back to Jerusalem to rebuild Jerusalem and the foundation temple, his name was Cyrus. Right? And folks, can you want to hear what's even more shocking? Let me shock you a little more. When Isaiah wrote Isaiah 44, 28, watch here, guys. When Isaiah wrote Isaiah 44, 28, the temple was standing in Jerusalem. It wasn't destroyed. And when Isaiah wrote Isaiah 44, 28, the Babylonians were an insignificant nobody. The superpowers that were threatening Israel at the time were the Assyrians, my ancestors, and the Egyptians. And here Isaiah doesn't say the Assyrians will take in captivity or the Egyptians. He mentions a people that were an insignificant nobody, Babylonians, right? Someone at that time would be saying, Babylonians, what are you talking about? That insignificant people there, they're going to do what again? Not the Assyrians? So Isaiah knew it wasn't the Assyrians, my ancestors, or the Egyptians, but the Babylonians would rise in power and dominate and enslave the Jews. And then he knew Cyrus would destroy the Babylonians and set the Jews free. How in the world did he know all that before it happened? Are you with me there? Are you with me there? So guys, if you're a liberal and you don't believe God inspires scriptures or that God doesn't exist. Now you're a liberal. You can't believe God inspired this book because if there is a God, he's he's inactive. It's deism. He just put laws in motion, doesn't interrupt those laws. And let's just creation unfold the way it's the way it's been going. Or you're an atheist. You don't believe God exists. How do you explain these prophecies? Guess what? Liberal critical scholarship says the book of Isaiah was actually three separate books, not written by the same person. They break it down into three sections. This is liberal critical scholarship. They'll say Isaiah chapter 1 to 39, that's first Isaiah. And Isaiah chapter 40 to 55, which mentions Cyrus by name, that's called second Isaiah or Deutero Isaiah. And that was written after Cyrus came into power, 
after he set the Jews free. And so someone or a group of people wrote that section and then tried to put it back into the time of Isaiah in order to deceive people that Isaiah prophesied these events before they happened. And then they say Isaiah 56 to 66, that was written by someone else. So they call it Trito Isaiah. So according to these liberals, these agents of Satan, these pawns of the devil, your Isaiah, chapter 1 of 66, didn't come from one inspired prophet writing in the 8th century BC. It actually consists of three separate sections, chapter 1 and 39, written by the historical Isaiah, but chapters 40 to 55, written after the fact, after Cyrus came to power, after he set the Jews free, after he defeated the Babylonians, and then someone or a group of people try to pass it off as prophecies that the historical Isaiah made in advance. And then another group or another individual wrote Isaiah 56 to 66. That's why pay attention to your study notes. If you have a Bible or study note that says Deutero Isaiah. Let me write it for you. Deutero Isaiah or Trito Isaiah. You know their liberals are saying that Isaiah wasn't written by one prophet. And the reason why Cyrus is mentioned is because that section of Isaiah was written after Cyrus came to power. So that means they're impugning the integrity of these authors. That these authors produced a fake fraudulent writing and try to pass it off as the words of an historical figure writing in the 8th century B.C., making that figure announce the coming of Cyrus, even though that document was written after Cyrus was already in power. You get it now? You see now why I got upset in the previous session with that commentary on Psalms produced by Zondervan and why I'm upset with this commentary. Zondervan Academic, Zondervan Publishing, claims to be an evangelical conservative publishing house. Why are they producing the commentaries of by liberals who say these things about the books of the Bible? Now, can I give you New Testament proof? Can I give you proof from Jesus and his followers that Isaiah chapter 40 to 55 was written? By the same Isaiah of the 8th century B.C. who wrote Isaiah chapter 1 to 39. Can I give you proof from Jesus and his followers? The Lord Jesus and his followers. That Isaiah chapters 40 to 55. That section that they said was written after Cyrus came into power and not by Isaiah. That according to Jesus, according to his followers, according to the New Testament. The same Isaiah in the 8th century B.C. wrote it. Can I give you the verses to prove it? Are you guys bored already? Who's ready? You want some evidence? Okay. Let's go to John 1, 23. John 1, 23. John 1, 23. What does the Baptist say? He said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as said the prophet Esaias. No, John the Baptist. Isaiah didn't write Isaiah 40. Don't you know that Zondervan is going to produce commentaries by liberals that say that part of Isaiah was written after Cyrus came to power in the 6th century B.C.? And it wasn't written by the historical Isaiah. John the Baptist, though you're filled with the Holy Spirit in your mother's womb, filled with the Holy Spirit, and though you hear God's voice audibly, you're wrong, buddy. Right? Oh, but I still, let's wait, wait, hold on. Let's go to Luke 3, verses 3 to 6. Yeah, there's uh, Guy Wilkerson. If you're established in scriptures and you're solid in your faith, there's some meat in there. Not enough meat, just enough meat. Uh, just uh, Not too, enough meat, but there is. You can glean some nuggets, right? And I wasted, what, 70 bucks on this. Oh, well. Luke 3, 3 to 6. And he came into all the country about Jordan, preaching the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. 
as it is written in the book of the words of Esaias the prophet. And then it quotes Isaiah 40, verses 3 to 6. Wait, 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 wait. I'm sorry. It quotes Isaiah 40, verses 3 to 5. Isaiah 40, verses 3 to 5. Wait, 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 wait. Luke, what are you talking about? According to liberal scholarship, that's Deutero Isaiah. The historical Isaiah didn't write in the 8th century BC. What's wrong with you? Don't you know your Bible? Why are you quoting Isaiah 40 verses 3 to 5 as written by the prophet Isaiah? Dude, Luke, what's wrong with you, man? Exactly. It is like crab legs. Right? Okay, but hold on. Let's go to Luke 4, 16 to 21. Luke 4, 16 to 21. Yeah, smash the like button, please, guys. Luke 4, 16 to 21. And it's not just one. Yeah, again, Luke, you're right. Yeah. And he, Jesus comes to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue. And on the Sabbath day, and he and stood up for to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. So he's got the scroll of the prophet Isaiah. And what does Jesus quote, guys? Notice what he quotes. And when he opened the book, he found the place where it is written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. But wait, that's Isaiah 61, verses 1 to 2. Jesus takes the scroll of Isaiah and reads Isaiah 61, verses 1 to 2. And Luke tells us that's the scroll of Isaiah. And Jesus says, today this prophecy is fulfilled in your hearing. Wait, Luke, there you did it again. And Jesus, why didn't you correct them? They gave you the scroll of Isaiah. And you went to Isaiah 61, which is supposed to be Trito Isaiah. The third section of Isaiah written by someone or a group different from the group that wrote second Isaiah and from the Isaiah who wrote the first section. Jesus, why didn't you say, oh, by the way, I'm quoting from Trito Isaiah. This Isaiah 61 is Trito, Trito Isaiah. Jesus, come on. You're the God man. Why didn't you correct the Jews? Exactly, Mike. Romans 10, 20 to 21. Romans 10, 20 to 21. Watch here. You see how poisonous and disgusting scholarship has become? But Esaias is very bold and saith, I was... Wait, wait, wait. Did you see what Paul just said? Isaiah was very bold when he said, and he quotes Isaiah 65, verses 1 to 2. Paul quotes Isaiah chapter 65, verses 1 to 2. And he says, Isaiah spoke these words boldly. Wait, Paul. What is wrong with you, Paul? That's Trito. Isaiah, Paul, get with the program, dude. Hello. Earth calling Paul. That's third Isaiah. It's not even written by the same one or a group that wrote second. Deuteronomy Isaiah, dude, get with the program, man. You need to come to seminary, Paul. Come on, Paul. Darn it, Paul. Mike, that's it, man. The Muslims got a case. This Paul didn't know it. He needed to go to seminary. Do you see every section of Isaiah is attributed to Isaiah? The section of Isaiah 40 to 55 is said to be written by Isaiah. The third section, Isaiah 56 to 66, is said to be written by Isaiah. Can you quote to me a single place in the New Testament from Jesus and his followers where they ascribe any part of Isaiah to someone other than Isaiah? Are you still not convinced? Let's go to Acts 8. Let's read 30 to 35. Acts 8, 30 to 35. Sorry about that, hold on. Acting up here. Okay, read this with me. And Philip ran thither to him and heard him read the prophet Esaias. Who did he hear him reading? The eunuch, Ethiopian eunuch, on his return from Jerusalem to Ethiopia. He heard him reading the prophet Esaias and said, Understandest thou what thou readest? And he said, How can I, except some man should guide me? And 
he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. The place of the scripture which he read was this, and he's now reading Isaiah chapter 53, folks. Isaiah chapter 53, folks. The place of the scripture which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and unlike, unlike a lamb dumb before his shearer, so opened he not his mouth. In his humiliation, his judgment was taken away, and who shall declare his generation, for his life is taken from the earth. And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee, of whom speaketh the prophet this? My goodness, Philip. Philip, filled with the Holy Spirit. Philip, told by the Holy Spirit. Why didn't you correct this man? Who said the prophet wrote Isaiah 53? Philip, tell him it's Deutero Isaiah. It's second Isaiah. Hello, Philip. Hello. Why is he saying the prophet? And why does Luke the narrator say he's reading Isaiah's Isaiah? So wait, Luke thinks Isaiah wrote Isaiah chapter 40 to 55. The eunuch thinks it's the prophet who wrote it, Isaiah. Philip doesn't correct him, but goes with it. But wait, Philip, who told you to attach yourself to that chariot? Acts 8, 26 and 29. Acts 8, 26 and 29. Verse 26 and 29. Let's see. Exactly, Shamir. He needed Zondervan's commentaries. He needed these commentaries. I wish I could go back in time and say, here, let me gift you with scholarship. Guys, man, get with the program. Right? Okay. Acts 8, 26 and 29. And a final example. Oh, yeah, that's another one. In fact, we're going to go to that one first. Now, thank you for reminding me because there are both Isaiah 6 and Isaiah 53 are attributed to Isaiah. We'll look at that as the final one. Okay, read here. Acts 8, 26. And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise and go toward the south unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. Now, 29, Acts 8, 29. 29, I didn't say 26 to 29. Protestant, get with the program, dude. Start reading Trito Isaiah. Maybe the cure your Alzheimer's. Acts 8, 29. Then the Spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself to this chariot. Wait, 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 wait. Philip, an angel told you to go attach yourself to the chariot, and then the Holy Spirit told you. So that means you're Spirit-filled, instructed by the Spirit, and guided by the Spirit to preach, yes. So didn't the Spirit tell you that the section he's reading... Is Deutero Isaiah written after Cyrus in 6th century B.C.? Why didn't you correct him, Philip? My goodness. Can't even trust Philip. Right? Matthew 12, 17 to 21. Two final examples. Guys, we're going to still get into uh, Melchizedek. Just, it's a long day. It's Saturday. I'm all alone in this state without my daughter, so I have nothing to do but teach all day. So I can do a four-hour session. So don't cry. Okay, now, Matthew 12, 17 to 21. Protestants start reading, try to Isaiah. That it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Esaias the prophet, saying, Behold, my servant whom I have chosen. Guess what he just quoted here? Matthew quotes Isaiah chapter 42, verses 1 of 4. He quotes Isaiah 42, verses 1 of 4. And Matthew says, this was written by the prophet Isaiah. No Matthew, no Luke, no Paul, no Philip. Isaiah did not write Isaiah 40 to 55, and he didn't write Isaiah 56 to 66. What is the matter with all of you? My goodness, I'm tired of these folks. Final one, John 12, 37 to 41. John 12, 37 to 41. You're going to have blood squirting out of you if you keep asking me, did Adam and Eve have blood? And it's not because of me, because Protestants are going to lay hands on you. John 12, 37 to 41. Read with me, folks. Read. But, read with me. Though he had done so many miracles before them, yet they believed not on him, that the, that the saying of Esaias, Isaiah the prophet, might be fulfilled, which he spake, Lord, who had believed our report, and to whom hath the arm of the Lord been revealed. 
John quotes Isaiah 53 verse 1 and says, this is a saying that Isaiah the prophet wrote. But then let's read 39 and 41. Therefore, they could not believe because Esaias said again, and again, the same Isaiah said, the same Isaiah who wrote Isaiah 53, 1, also said this, and he quotes Isaiah 6, 10. He that blinded their eyes. Guys, John just said, one and the same Isaiah wrote Isaiah 53 and wrote Isaiah 6. Jesus Christ is Lord. I don't think you're listening. Kareem is a young man who's open to the truth and he's hungry for God. Please be charitable with him. Okay, did you catch it? Notice every portion of Isaiah is ascribed to Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 1 to 39, attributed to Isaiah. Isaiah chapters 40 to 55, attributed to Isaiah. Isaiah chapters 56 to 66, attributed to Isaiah. The New Testament as a whole says all of it is written by Isaiah. One of the same prophet in the 8th century BC. So then why are they saying parts of it is not written by Isaiah? Because in Isaiah 44, 24 and Isaiah 45 verse 1, it accurately prophesies that the Babylonian Empire will come to dominance, not the Assyrian Empire, not the Egyptian Empire. And that temple that was standing at the time of Isaiah will be destroyed, even though it was standing in his day. And then the king by the name Cyrus will defeat the Babylonians, release the Jews, and commission them to rebuild the temple. He wrote all of that in the 8th century BC, which from a human perspective, that was impossible for him to say. Isaiah, what are you talking about? The temple standing. What are you talking about the Babylonians? They're insignificant nobodies. The Assyrians are the threat. The Egyptians are the threat. Who are the Babylonians that are going to come and attack us? And the temple will be rebuilt? And then some guy named Cyrus is going to come and set us free. What are you talking about, Isaiah? All of this about 200 years before it happened. But when you're a liberal and you don't believe God exists or you don't believe God inspired the Bible, you're going to have to explain it away. And you're going to have to accuse Jesus of not knowing what he's talking about or being dishonest because he knew better. And the New Testament writers of not knowing what they were talking about. This is why you got to get Gleason, Archer's, Encyclopedia of Bible Difficulties, and Survey of the Old Testament. He demolishes all these claims for the glory of the triune God. Right? Exciting stuff? So now I want you to be alert. Anytime you hear someone say, Deutero, Isaiah, you know what they're saying. Anytime you hear someone say trito, trito, T-R-I-T-O, uh, Isaiah, that's a liberal who thinks the, the book of Isaiah was actually three separate sections written at different centuries combined together and passed off as the writing of one author in the 8th century B.C. You get it now? Aren't you thankful, folks? For the glory of the triune God for raising solid men and women who love the Bible and know it's historically accurate and still affirm traditional authorship of these books. And because of the grace of the triune God are amassing historical, archaeological, textual proofs to destroy these satanic lies against the authorship of the Bible. Because our God is real. He is alive. And that is his book. He will protect it and raise up his soldiers to silence these liars. Silence them. Expose them, lest they deceive my people. Praise the triune God. Right? Amen, Eugene. Aren't you thankful? And I am so thankful, folks. Honest, honestly, I say this. Thank the triune God. He didn't let me go the route of liberal scholarship and did not let me go to seminary or even Bible college to be taught these destructive viewpoints that now conservatives are embracing. At one time, they used to refute them. Gleason Archer was a warrior of the 20th century. Norman Geisler, another. These men of the 20th century used to refute these views. Now, in the 21st century, in the 21st century, 
You have evangelical scholars who are now espousing these views. You'll have evangelical scholars speaking of Deutero-Isaiah and Trito-Isaiah, yet claiming to believe in the inspiration of the Bible. Yes, Kareem. Not all Bible colleges. There are still solid Bible colleges that preach the truth and produce the evidence of history, archaeology, and the textual evidence to show these are wrong views, lies, deceits, Satanic attacks on the Bible. And aren't you thankful that the triune God who loves you, who's in love with you, is guiding you? The Holy Spirit is guiding you to the right sources, to the right videos, and the right teachers to educate you and preserve you by the power of the Holy Spirit? I'm not talking about myself. I'm not the only one. I'm not the only one. There are many. You know who also affirms? You know, also defends and fights for traditional conservative view of the Bible and the authorship of these books. You know who also does that? What apologist does that out there? And you guys may not like it if I mention it. You know who? No, I, of course, David would. That's a given. He's my partner. James R. White. Yes. Thank God for the good that comes from that man. Okay. You know who's also another Bible expositor and preacher who affirms these traditional conservative views of authorship? John MacArthur. John Piper. Of course, Anthony Rogers. That's a given. Okay. Yep. Peter Gentry. Jojo Mon Monster. Yep. So we haven't lost all the conservatives. They're still there. Frankly, Che, I have not read all the notes, Franklin. But here's what I want you to do for me, Franklin. I want you to get the ESV study Bible. Yep, John Hagee too, yes. But he's more of a pastor and preacher than a theologian. Do me a favor, Frank Che. When you get an ESV study Bible, look at what they say about the author of a particular book because they have when you open up like Isaiah they'll have author see if they affirm that like say in the case of Daniel Daniel wrote it Isaiah wrote it right meaning wrote Isaiah if so then praise God right praise God now with that said to whet your appetites I'm just beginning folks folks let me tell you as the Lord Jesus tarries as the Lord Jesus tarries more and more of so-called conservative evangelical scholars are going to sound like liberals so that the safest thing to do is not to go to Bible college and seminary, but seek the Holy Spirit, seek the face of the Holy Spirit, ask the Spirit to guide you to the right teachers, and he will, like he's doing now. Yeah, right? And I'm not boasting about myself, God forbid, like he did for me. Honestly. Let me repeat again. I'm sound like a broken record. Do not waste your time going to Bible college or seminary. If you're going to go to school, go to school and get a degree in some secular field so that you can have a job that you can make money and live off of so you're not at the mercy of men, so you don't prostitute yourself for money. And get a Bible education by saying, Holy Spirit, you are God. You are real. You are alive. And you live in me. Guide me to the right teachers, the right sources, and protect me from error. Matthew McCarroll, do not change the subject into perseverance of the saints. I don't know if you're here when I mentioned the rules. Don't pontificate. Don't get into side debates. Focus on the topic or you're going to have to leave. Focus. Good for you, Irene. God bless you. May you prosper in your dental work. May you use your work as an opportunity to be Jesus to the people. And the Lord bless you with that money. Use that money wisely to feed the poor, take care of the widow, and visit the sick and support the ministers of God with the money you have, as well as your own family. See, guys, let me repeat what this brother just said. Jesus Christ is the Lord. Notice what he just said, folks. Liberalism is also spreading to the Middle East. He goes, pray for the Arabic evangelical church in the Middle East, since the largest seminary over there, a.k.a. ABTS, is teaching liberal theology. 
So Satan's liberal theology has now spread like gangrene, gangrene even to the Middle East. You got it? Everyone with me there? Are we ready to begin? Again, thank the Lord Jesus for putting my heart to do full-time ministry. And thank the Lord Jesus for his faithfulness in providing for ministry through the people of God. Here's another book that I got to my life, that I had added to my library. This too is by a liberal. James L. Kugel. But it's a different sort of book. The Bible as it was. He's written several volumes along similar lines. Even though he's a liberal, this is a different kind of book. This book examines how the Jews and Christians throughout the centuries interpreted, understood specific Bible stories. Which one, Kareem Abdullah? This one? Or the sources on conservative dating of the Bible? Okay. See this here? James L. Kugel. The reason why this, well, you got to go to Amazon. Go to Amazon, look it up, and then Kareem, make sure you download or click on the links to my articles. Start reading my articles as well. I want you to read them and also watch my sessions on YouTube as well as Anthony Rogers and others. But now, okay, James Kugel. This is a different type of book. This book is not a liberal attack on the Bible. It's simply a survey. Listen to this. A survey on how the Jews and Christians historically throughout the ages interpreted specific historical events in the Bible and specific passages, right? Everyone with me? This is a different kind of book. It's not an attack on the Bible. It's simply a survey into the literature of the Jews and Christians throughout the centuries, how they interpreted books like Genesis and the story of Adam and Eve and Cain and Abel and Melchizedek and so on and so forth. Excellent survey. Excellent. A lot of meat. Now, the reason why I have this book, he has a section on Melchizedek. He has a section on Melchizedek, which I don't think I'm going to be able to read because I got to get a lamp. It's not too bright here. Let's see if I can use my phone. Okay, you sinners. Let's see if I can do it. Are you ready now? It's not working, Marnie. How does this work, man? Come on. All right. It's not working, my light. Okay. Here's a section here. He discusses how the Jewish sources understood the story of Melchizedek because Melchizedek only appears twice in the Hebrew Scriptures. Okay. Well, it's because Rick Henson, he's quoting the sources, Rick. He's quoting the Targums, the Talmud, or Apocrypha. He's simply quoting saying this is what they said. Okay. That's what he's doing. Now. Melchizedek is only mentioned twice in the Hebrew Scriptures in two different books. We're going to look at that. And these passages baffled the Jews. The Jews were baffled by the references to Melchizedek because he appears out of nowhere. Not much detail is given concerning his history, his genealogy, his ancestry, and why he's such an important figure. Are you guys now ready to go into the meat? Are you guys ready? And I'll look at some of the things he says. If I can see. Yeah, okay. I'm gonna, yeah, I can see. Are you ready? Melchizedek only appears twice in the Hebrew Bible. And he appears out of nowhere. His ancestry is not given. His history is not given. He appears out of nowhere as this amazingly important figure. And he's honored by God. But not much information is given. Why is he so honored? Why is he so great? Why is he so exalted? We're not told. Let's look at it. Genesis chapter 14, verses 18 to 20. Let's go into the meat. Because people want me to explain Hebrews 7, 1. Yep, exactly. In the Old Testament, it's Genesis 14, verses 18 to 20, and then Psalm 110, verse 4. Let's go. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High God. Now, pay attention here. He's the king of Salem. He brings bread and wine. Bread and wine. First connection with Jesus. 
bread and wine. At the Last Supper, Jesus breaks bread and offers wine. Melchizedek, king of Salem, king of Shalem. Shalem in Hebrew comes from the same root where we get Shalom. So he's king of peace. Melchi Zedek. Melchi means my king of righteousness of justice. So he is the king of justice, the king of peace, and he brings bread and wine. But not only does he bring bread and wine, he's the priest. No, it's not a theophany, Tommy. See, again, you guys are jumping the gun. No, he's not a theophany. Be patient. <laughs> Get off your horse, Tommy. <laughs> All right. He's a priest of the Most High God. Notice 19. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abraham of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. Right? And blessed be the Most High God, which had delivered thine enemies into thy hand, and he gave him tithes of all. Whoa. Okay, wait, wait, wait. Abraham is the friend of God. Abraham is the chosen of God. Abraham is the heir of the covenant. And yet Melchizedek is so great, Abraham gives him a tithe, a tenth of his possessions in honor of his status as God's priest and allows him to bless him, allows Melchizedek to bless Abraham. Even Abraham realized the greatness of this Melchizedek and realized he's the priest of the same God that Abraham worshipped. Send Daniel on his merry way because this is a fake Daniel. This guy is the Daniel from, from Tartarus, this wicked demon. Get him out of here. This stupid moron attacking me for a friendship. First red flag. Filthy dog attacking me for a friendship because he's got no friends. Okay, now follow me, right? Guys, who is this Melchizedek that appears out of nowhere that Abraham recognizes to be the priest of the same true God that Abraham worships, who is such a powerful spiritual figure that Abraham allows him, Melchizedek, to bless him and then acknowledges his greatness by giving him a tithe, whereas Abraham refused to receive anything from the king of Sodom. In the same chapter, when the king of Sodom wants to honor Abraham, Abraham refuses him. Why do you refuse the king of Sodom, but you acknowledge the greatness of this Melchizedek, Abraham? We're not told. We're not told. But then the only other time Melchizedek is mentioned. Psalm 110, verses 1 of 4. But then the only other time Melchizedek is mentioned. Psalm 110, Verses 1 of 4. Be patient, brother. In Jesus' name, we'll get there. No, it's not Jesus. And I'm buffering. Lord Jesus, bless the connection. So, Josh, be patient. Be patient. We'll get to Hebrews 7, 3. No, it's not Jesus. Just be patient, brother. But let's read Psalm 110, verses 1 of 4. Yeah, it was buffering. But praise God, it's much better. Psalm 110, verses 1 of 4. A Psalm of David. Jehovah, Neom, Yehovah, La Adoni. The Lord said unto my Lord, sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. The Lord Jehovah shall send the rod of thy strength out of Zion. So this Lord of David rules in Zion. Zion is the holy hill in Jerusalem. So he's the Davidic king. He's a king in Jerusalem. Neum, Yehovah, La Adoni. Okay, strength out of Zion. Rule thou in the midst of thine enemies. Thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power. And the beauties of holiness from the womb of the morning, thou hast the dew of thy youth. Now notice what God says to David's Lord. David's Lord being a ruler, a king ruling in Zion, in Jerusalem. Notice what he says in verse 4. The Lord Jehovah has sworn and will not repent. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Wow. Here is Melchizedek again. The only other mention of Melchizedek. In a psalm talking about David's Lord who rules in Jerusalem, the very place where Melchizedek ruled. And notice how great Melchizedek is. This Lord is a priest in the order of Melchizedek. What? Who is this Melchizedek? That David's Lord is a priest in his order, in his line. We're not told. Why Melchizedek? 
Well, someone will try to make the connection and say, well, because David's Lord reigns in Jerusalem, that was the place that Melchizedek ruled from. He also ruled in Jerusalem, even though there's a debate in some of the sources. Some sources say Shadim is not Jerusalem, but it's a place near Shechem. But forget about that. The point is, who is this Melchizedek that even Abraham, Abraham acknowledges and realizes his greatness before God, that he's a priest of the true God that Abraham himself worships, and gives him a tithe to recognize his greatness. He's so great, he blesses Abraham and blesses God. And Melchizedek is so great that David's Lord is a priest in the order of Melchizedek. Are you now sure? Are you now ready? I know, but Abdul Halaj, some people will say that the Shalem and some of the Jewish sources they they identified with another location, and that's all documented in this. James Kugel, but I'll get to that. Guys, are you now ready for us to unpack the meat? Rick Henson, the ties go to the priests. If Melchizedek was a priest of a foreign alien god, Abraham would not give him a tithe. Why is he giving a tithe to a priest who's serving a pagan god, a foreign god? To ask the question is to answer it. Abraham would not give a tithe to a priest of a foreign alien god. One means, Kareem means yes, and two means no. Okay, so, but now here's what's even more astonishing. Psalm 110, let's read verse 1 and 2 again. Verse, verses 1 and 2 again. Tommy, you're reading the New Testament into the Old Testament. Can you be patient, brother? Can you wait? Because when Psalm 110 was, was written, they didn't have the New Testament. Try to put yourself in the shoes of the original audience and recipients of these scriptures to see how baffling it would be to them. So, Tommy, relax, breathe, get off your horse again. <laughs> Park that horse, Tommy. <laughs> okay. Psalm 110, verses 1 to 2. Okay, read with me. A psalm of David, the Lord Jehovah said unto my Lord, sit thou at my right hand until I make thy enemies thy footstool. Now notice where David's Lord, his kingdom <clears throat> extends from. His kingdom extends from where? Zion. Zion is the hill in Jerusalem. So his kingdom extends from Jerusalem. Now, folks, follow with me. According to the Hebrew Bible, only a, da a Davidite, only the descendants of David from the tribe of Judah can rule in Jerusalem. Are you with me there? Everyone following me? Only David's seed, physical descendants of David, were given authority by God to rule in Jerusalem from Jerusalem. Okay. But here's the problem. Psalm 110.4 says, this ruler whose kingdom extends from Jerusalem and spreads all over the earth and subjugates his enemies to his rule is a priest. Jehovah has sworn and will not repent. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Now, here's the second baffling thing to a Jew reading this when it's first written. Number one, how can this be David's Lord? If he's ruling from Jerusalem, he has to be David's son. But if he's David's son, that means he's inheriting the throne from David. So he can't be as great as David, let alone greater than David. But he's much greater than David. So that's the first puzzling thing that makes you scratch your head. And number two, he's also a priest. But according to Numbers 3, verses 5 to 10, priests came from the line of Aaron from the tribe of Levi you could not be a priest from the tribe of Judah and the line of David. But this one is a priest. Numbers 3, verses 5 to 10. Do you see how baffling it gets if you're a Jew reading this when it's first written before Jesus shows up? Numbers 3, 5 to 10. 
And Jehovah the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Bring the tribe of Levi near and present them before Aaron the priest, and they may minister unto him. And they shall keep his charge and the charge of the whole congregation before the tabernacle of the congregation to do the service of the tabernacle. And they shall keep all the instruments of the tabernacle of the congregation and the charge of the children of Israel to do the service of the tabernacle. And thou shalt give the Levites unto Aaron and his sons. They are wholly given unto him out of the children of Israel. And they and thou shalt appoint Aaron and his sons, and they shall wait on their priest's office. And the stranger that cometh nigh shall be put to death. Bam. Only Aaron and his sons are priests, and only the Levites can serve the priest, performing priestly functions in the tabernacle. If it's someone from another tribe, put him to death. You see what God is doing? He's blowing their minds away to prepare them for someone greater than they could imagine. Now, let, let me, let's unpack the mystery of Psalm 110. Let's unpack the mystery of Psalm 110. Are you ready with me? Are you ready to follow with me? Okay. David's Lord rules. His, his kingdom extends from Jerusalem. To a Jew reading that, they'll say, wait. But the kingdom of Jerusalem is given to David and his sons. Okay, follow the logic here, guys. If, you, if you're not following logic, you won't get the point. You won't see how amazing these Old Testament texts are, that God is already preparing people for a king who's a priest, a priestly king, a royal priest. He's already preparing them for Jesus being both a king and a priest. Now watch what God is doing to them. David's Lord, his kingdom ex extends from Jerusalem. Okay, I'm really baffled here. The kingdom in Jerusalem is given to David and his physical sons. The only one who could rule from Jerusalem is the son of David. But David says this one is his Lord. That means he's greater than David. Because if he's a son of David then he can't be greater than David. He's subject to David. And if he inherits the throne from David, he's still not greater than David and not as great as David because it's David's throne that he's ruling on representing David. But this one is greater than David. But how can he be greater than David and rule from Jerusalem when God said only David's sons can rule from Jerusalem as David's heirs in the place of David? You see what God is doing to their mind? Follow with me. Be patient. We're going to get to Melchizedek. But you see what he's doing to the Jews who are reading this? What? David's Lord rules from Jerusalem? But the throne of Jerusalem belongs to David. And all the sons of David who then take the throne... Do so in the place of David as the heirs of David, as David's representatives. So at no point in time can they be greater than David when it's his throne they're inheriting. But this Lord, he rules from Jerusalem. How can he be David's son? Oh, man, I'm baffled. Wow. I, I What's going on here? And Jesus plays off of this. Mark 12, 35 to 37. Jesus plays off of this. Mark 12, 35 to 37. Mark 12, 35 to 37. Yep. Watch here. And Jesus answered and said, while he taught in the temple, how say the scribes that Christ is the son of David? For David himself said by the Holy Ghost, David himself, by the Holy Spirit, revealing it to David, making David know and aware, the Lord said to my Lord, sit thou on my right hand till I make thine enemies thy footstool. David therefore himself calleth Christ, the Messiah, him Lord. Whence is he then his son? And the common people heard him gladly. See what Jesus just did? David received revelation from the Holy Spirit. The Messiah, the Christ, is the Lord who sits at the right hand of Jehovah. So David knew the Christ is the one who's sitting on 
the right hand of God and that the Christ is his Lord. But then he says, how can he be his son? Because you guys know the sons of David are not David's Lord. They're subject to David, and it's his throne that they're sitting on representing him, so they can't be his Lord. They're always subject to him because it's David's throne that they are receiving because they're the sons of David as his heir re representing him on the throne. But David knew by revelation of the Holy Spirit that the Christ is the one who is his Lord that sits at God's right hand. So what's the answer, scholars? What's your answer? They didn't answer him. They walked away. They went silent, it said. Do you know why? Because either that means the Christ is not David's son. Now, folks, follow with me. The options. That either means the Christ is not David's son, but then that means God's promise to David has been falsified. God swore over and over again. And you can read Psalm 89. Read the entire chapter, Psalm 89. Right? Right? Psalm 132, write these down. Psalm 89, the entire psalm. Psalm 132, the entire psalm. As the Holy Spirit enables me to recall these passages perfectly for the glory of Jesus, right? 2 Samuel chapter 7, write that down. 2 Samuel chapter 7, 1 Chronicles 17. God swore to David, the throne is yours, the kingdom is yours in Jerusalem forever, so that you'll never fail to have a son from your loins sitting on it. So that if the Christ is not David's son, then God revoked the covenant with David. But that can't be. God swore, swore, especially in Psalm 89, the throne in Jerusalem is yours, David. But then if he is David's son, he can't be his Lord because it's David's throne. It's David's covenant. It's a promise made to David that his physical sons are inheriting from their father. So they're always subject to their father. And it's because he's their physical father that they even have a right to sit on the throne. So what's the answer? Carry him watch it. Make sure to listen to it later on and all the way through. What's the answer? What's the answer? If he's not David's son, that means God revoked the covenant. And God swore he'll never revoke his covenant with David. If he is David's son, he can't be his Lord. But Jesus said he is the Christ and he is David's Lord. So does that mean he's not his son? Then that means God revoked his promise to David. No, let's go to Mark 10, 46 to 48. Yes, Mike, they don't believe. The Jews today don't believe. Watch here. But wait, wait, wait. Who's incredible? You talking to me, medic? <laughs> because the triune God that works in us and through us and lives in us, who loves us, he's infinitely incredible. Mark 10, 46 to 48. Guys, read with me. Mark 10, 46 to 48. And they came to Jericho. And as he went out of Jericho with his disciples, and a great number of people, blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the highway side begging. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David. So he is the son of David. Have mercy on me. And many charged him that he should hold his peace, but he cried the more a great deal, the son of David, have mercy on me. So wait, wait, wait. Jesus is the Christ and he's the son of David. But Jesus, you said, if you're a son of David, you can't be his Lord, but you are his Lord. So the Christ is David's Lord. And the Christ is David's son, and Jesus is the Christ. Now I'm really confused, Jesus. Now what's the answer? Hello, I'm trying to get you to see that though I'm the Christ and I'm the son of David as a man, I'm more than human. I am David's Lord because I'm also the son of God and therefore his God. Hello, Psalm 110 points to me having two natures pointing to the fact that I'm the God man. The Anthropos, that's my point. Hello. Who would have thought that Psalm 1 2, Psalm 110, I'm sorry, who would have thought that Psalm 110 is a proof text for the Messiah being the God man? Because he's God, he's David's Lord. Because he's man, he's David's son, but he's more than his son. By the way, I did a series on this. 
It's on my YouTube channel less than a year ago. Glory to God made increase king of kings for his glory. Now, you understand why, folks, why I get livid and angry when you have when you have evangelical scholars, and I don't have the comment, comment here with me, published by Zondervan, Academic, and other so-called conservative publishing companies that say that Psalm 110 wasn't written by David. It was either written by a court poet about David or is written sometime after David died about some king of Judah, son of David, or even written after the ex exile. You understand when you say David didn't write it, you just destroyed Jesus' entire polemic and argument? And you know what's sad? That's how the Jews get around it who don't believe in Jesus. That's how liberals get around it who don't believe in Jesus. The Jews who don't believe in Jesus will say, David didn't write it. The Jews who don't believe in Jesus say, David didn't write this. The Jews today say, no, David didn't write it, even though the psalm says the psalm of David. David didn't write it. And you know what's sad? Liberals agree. Liberals agree with the Jews who deny Jesus. Yeah, David didn't write it. But even more sad, more heartbreaking, you have evangelical scholars, even evangelical professors one of whom teaches at Dallas Theological Seminary, who says this psalm was written by some court poet about some unnamed king. So I, I'm not surprised that Jesus denying Jews would want to say David didn't write it. And I'm not surprised that liberals who don't believe the Bible is God's word would want to deny it. But how dare you, an evangelical Christian, Deny that it was David who wrote this when the entire <clears throat> power of the argument hinges on David writing this about Jesus. You see why I get angry now? Now, put that aside. Notice that Jesus' contemporaries, the Jews, could not deny. Notice when Jesus argued, number one, they could not deny Davidic authorship. No one challenged said, who told you David wrote it? Because it says David wrote it. The psalm, it says it in Hebrew. Mizmor Dawid. Uh, Dawid. Mizmor Dawid. La Dawid. So they couldn't deny it. And secondly, they couldn't deny it's about the Messiah. So notice Jesus' Jewish contemporaries, Jesus' Jewish contemporaries agreed with Jesus. David wrote it, and it's about the Messiah. It's only later on they started denying it because they wanted to rob Christians of an Old Testament proof text to the Messiah being the God-man distinct from the Father. Are you with me there? Sad about what? I don't know. Someone sad? And let's go to Acts 2, 34 to 35. Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit on Pentecost, 50 days after Jesus' crucifixion, 10 days after his physical ascension into heaven, Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, to his Jewish contemporaries, to his Jewish audience, notice what he quotes, Acts 2, 34-35. For David is not ascended into the heavens, but he saith himself, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand until I make thy foes thy footstool. Not one Jew said today, Peter, wait, Peter. You got all wrong. David didn't write that. What are you talking about, Peter? Who told you David wrote it? Not one Jew contradicted Peter and denied that David wrote Psalm 110. So the Jewish contemporaries of the Lord Jesus and his followers, they agreed with Jesus and his followers. David wrote Psalm 110, and it's about the Messiah. How dare you, evangelical conservative Christian, claiming to be Trinitarian, to then come now, write commentaries for Christians, and teach this in your seminaries and colleges. This psalm, we don't know who wrote it. Maybe David wrote it so that a poet would sing it about David, or maybe David wrote it about Solomon, or maybe some poet wrote it about some unnamed king, and maybe it was written before they went into captivity by the Babylonians or when they returned. How dare you take that position?
Guys, can you remind me to give you the series of articles I wrote on Psalm 110? I wrote about half a dozen articles on Psalm 110, proving from the Old Testament David wrote it, proving he wrote about the Messiah, and proving that this shows that the Messiah is the God-man. Do not let me close the session without giving you the links, and God willing, we'll put the links in the description box. Okay, now, if you're living at the time of Jesus, or even at the time of the composition of Psalm 110, right? It would have left you baffled. You would have said, wait, how can this ruler whose kingdom extends from Zion in Jerusalem be David's Lord? That's the first thing that would have baffled you. Are you with me there? It's in my articles. They have none. They're simply uh, on, when, on the wind of mind, they'll say David didn't wrote it. The superscription doesn't mean David wrote it. That's it. That's all they have. They have nothing else. I'm telling you, they have nothing else. Don't take my word for it. Go read it. They'll tell you, no, David didn't write it, even though the superscription said he wrote it. And they have nothing else to say. There is nothing internally that they can point to to show David didn't write it. But, okay, at the time of Jesus or before Jesus, even at the time of the composition, a Jew would have looked at that psalm and said, man, who is this David's Lord whose kingdom extends from Zion, Jerusalem, when we know the throne in Jerusalem is given to David? How can this one... Be David's Lord, and David worship him as Lord. See, that would have baffled you. The second thing that would have baffled you is, how can David's Lord, who is a ruler, who has to be a Judean from the tribe of Judah, be a priest? And after Melchizedek, who is this Melchizedek that David's Lord, who is the king, that whose kingdom extends from Jerusalem, is a priest in his order? What makes Melchizedek so special? That he's a priest in his order. Do you see how baffling and shocking Psalm 110 is? Do you see how baffling and shocking Psalm 110 is? But you guys, you know why you guys are not baffled and shocked by it? Because you come 2,000 years later. You know Jesus, you know the New Testament, and you know Jesus is the answer. So he said, ah, Jesus. That's why I want you to forget for a moment your Christians reading it in light of the revelation of Jesus in the New Testament. Imagine you're reading this before Jesus showed up. Imagine how baffled you'd be. You'd be like, man, what is this about? And what makes Melchizedek so special? You get it now? But you have an advantage. You're now coming after Jesus entered the earth, became the God-man, God who became man, after he went to heaven, after he poured out the Holy Spirit, after the apostles and their companions preached the gospel by revelation of the Holy Spirit and wrote down the New Testament books. books. So now you have the lens of the New Testament. Ah, oh, that's why. Now it makes sense. You with me there? But before Jesus, before the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, before the New Testament revelation, you understand how baffled you'd be? Am I losing anyone or is this making sense to everybody? Right? Pedro, don't you wish you were standing there when Jesus quoted Mark 12 to the Jewish scholars and they went, because they agreed with Jesus, David wrote it, and they agreed with Jesus. It was written about the Messiah. And yet they believe Messiah is the son of God. And then they're like, yeah, he's right. How can Messiah be his Lord if he's his son? And that's why they didn't answer. They're like, bleep, 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 bleep. they want silence said. They, they go, you know what? This, this man here is too much for us. This man, this Jewish man knows too much. We can't handle this, this man. We can't handle this, this Jewish man. He's Because they didn't think he was God. Right? Ah, uh, but now let's go into the meat. Here's this book. Guys, again, I want to thank you. I want Because as I'm putting this book, I really mean this from my heart. I truly beseech Lord Jesus to flood you in his love and flood your loved ones in his presence, wash you and your loved ones in his blood, seal you by the Spirit for your love for Jesus and for his servants. I truly want to thank you for your prayers, your fasting, and your financial support. It's because of you guys. I'm able to be in ministry and get these kind of resources and study them and make it accessible. So I want to thank you. You know who you are. The Lord Jesus bless you. Okay. Because now I'm going to read to you James Kugel. Here's, here's something interesting. 
And Abdul Halij can confirm this. Abdul Halij, you can confirm that the original Old Testament books were written without vowel markings. It was a consonantal text. So the original Old Testament writings were in with consonants, no vowel markings. Abdul Halij, can you confirm this? And you can confirm it by Googling it. Folks, let me explain what that means. Okay. Imagine English being written this way. Now, what did, what did I just write? What did I just write? Let me do it again. Imagine English written with consonants and no vowels. Thank you, King of Kings. Praise his trying name. Thank you, Franklin Che read it. No, no, it can't be he wasn't bad because T is not a vowel. He was in bed. You get it? He was. You would have to add the T because it's not a vowel. It's a consonant. That's how the Hebrew language was written until the Mezarites. The Mezarites are a group of Jewish scribes who in the 5th century, 400s, inserted vowel markings. Did you know that? Up until the 400s. See, Abdul Halij, notice he's saying I'm correct. Thank the Holy Spirit for enabling me to recall this information correctly for the glory of Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Fill us. Until 400 years after the birth of Christ, the Hebrew language had no vowel marks. It was consonantal. A group of Jewish scribes called the Mezarites introduced the vowel markings. So that means up until the 5th century AD, four years after Christ, this is how the Hebrew Old Testament would be written. Then these Jewish scribes came and they inserted vowel markings. Oh, I'm sorry. He was in bed. Sorry. Okay. Put me there. Now, why is that important? Are you aware that some verses, due to the consonantal structure, can legitimately be read differently? If you just go with the consonantal text, the Hebrew text went with consonants, some verses can be legitimately translated or read differently, like Hader Wood, who is illiterate, who has stole all my information, all my videos, all my articles, and produced videos with my information, taking credit for it. So he has about 500,000 followers and 800 people that he puts to sleep for his live session. He's now a millionaire making Boku bucks off of my knowledge. And here I'm panhandling. And yet I still carry him to this day. And I'm crippled. And now I need to order a wheelchair. Hater would come and do a hit and run, right, you terrorist? You now, guys, you know what he does, right? This proves to you that he's, he's listening to my sessions. And he's learning this information. And then he's stealing the info and producing videos. And he goes viral. And I'm still struggling panhandling. Hater would. All right. Now. Guys, follow with me. Are you with me there? Follow with me here. Psalm 110, verse 4. The consonantal structure of Psalm 110. If you read the text just with the consonants, it can be dotted. A different set of vowels can be added to make it read differently. Are you guys now ready? The way it reads now, because of the vowel markings introduced, in the 5th century A.D. by the Mezarites, it's you are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. However, if you just had the consonantal text, the consonants, you could dot it with a different set of vowels to read this way. Are you ready now? I'm not making it up. Are you ready? I'm going to read the paragraph by James Google. Okay. Ancient readers, right? Let me skip that paragraph. One way of understand. Well, you know, yeah. One way of understanding. Pay attention, folks. I need the light. One way of understanding the highlighted words in Psalm one ten four was guys, just going by the consonantal text, the consonants before the vowel markings were added. The consonantal text can be read in more than one way. It could be dotted the way we read it today. You are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek, or 
If you add a different set of vowel dottings, markings, it could be read this way. Imagine. One way of understanding the highland words in Psalm 110, 4 was, you are a priest forever by my order, O Melchizedek. Did you catch it? If you add a different set of vowel markings, vowel pointing, it wouldn't read, you are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. It would actually be read this way. You are a priest forever by my order, O Melchizedek. If this is the right translation, then it is Melchizedek who is being addressed throughout the psalm. And everything else in the psalm that refers to you must therefore be talking about Melchizedek. The psalm would thus seem to recount that Melchizedek had been appointed to the priesthood by God himself, since the whole verse of four would now be, the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind, you are a priest forever by my order, O Melchizedek. This would, of course, correspond to his description in Genesis as a priest of God, Most High. Indeed, a priest who was personally appointed by God <clears throat> must have been no ordinary priest, but an ancient forerunner to the exalted office of the high priest. And then he quotes Jewish sources. Philo of Alexandria, in his writing called On Abraham, number 235, when the high priest of God, Most High, saw him, approaching and bearing his quails. The high priest of God most high. And then in the apostolic constitutions, 8, 12, 23. You, God, are the one who appointed Melchizedek as a high priest in your service. And then finally, the Targum, Neophyti, Neophyti, I have our time pronouncing it, Neophyti, the Aramaic paraphrase, Genesis 14, 18, and Melchizedek, the king of Jerusalem, was a priest serving in the high priesthood before God Most High. You understand what this means? You understand what that means? Due to the consonantal structure of Psalm 110.4, because it's all in consonants, different set of vowel markings could be added so that now God is speaking to Melchizedek. God is saying to Melchizedek, you are David's Lord and you are priest forever, O Melchizedek. Now, everyone got that before I move on? So if you were to dot it differently, so that God is now speaking to Melchizedek, it's God saying to Melchizedek, you are David's Lord, and you, Melchizedek, are a priest forever. But hold on. If Melchizedek is a priest forever, when David wrote this, he wrote this 1,000 B.C., 1,000 years before the birth of Christ. Right? Centuries after Abraham had died. Centuries after Abraham had died. About 800 years after the death of Abraham. So if he's writing about 800 years after the death of Abraham, how can God still address Melchizedek and say, you Melchizedek are priest forever. Melchizedek would have died by this time. And how could David say of someone dead, he is my Lord and sits at God's right hand? You know what that means? Melchizedek is not dead. Melchizedek was taken into heaven and he was still alive, reigning on God's throne as Lord and a priest officiating before God in heaven. And folks, we have evidence that some Jews understood it that way. Some Jews under, un, understood it that way. Do you remember in my previous session I mentioned a scroll found in the Dead Sea, in the Dead sea area in the Qumran Caves? You remember in 1947 they discovered what's called the Dead Sea Scrolls. The Dead Sea Scrolls. They found them in what's known as the Caves of Qumran in the Dead Sea area. In Cave 11, Cave 11, they found a scroll talking about Melchizedek. Qumran, Cave 11. And they call it the Scroll of Melchizedek. So now it's called Q11 Melchizedek. Qumran, Cave 11, the Scroll about Melchizedek. And they translated in English. And I wrote an article on it. Okay? Let me give you the article again. Folks, are you, is this meat for you guys? Are you following with me? 
Let me get the article. You know I'm going to have to do a second session, right? Everything is twos or threes with me. Sorry. It's wrong link. Sorry about that. Pay, bear with me. Oh, boy. All right. Oop, I'm the wrong one. Sorry. I'm trying to get my article. Here you go. I gave you this link on my discussion on Psalm 82 in the previous session. Here's the link again. Okay. Did you know the Jews or the Jew that produced this scroll called Q11 Melchizedek? And I have an English translation, two English translations in my article. Here's my article. Okay. Did you know that those Jews who produced the Dead Sea Scrolls identified Melchizedek as the God of Psalm 82 who judges the gods and they identified the gods that Melchizedek judges as Satan, Belial, and his evil angelic spirit creatures. And they said that Melchizedek would atone for the sins of the people of God, for the lot of God, and would forgive their sins. And did you know that Psalm 7 and Isaiah 52, 7, which speaks of Jehovah, are applied to him, identifying him as God and as Jehovah in this scroll? Did you know that? Here's the link. And it's quoted here by James Kugel. Right here, it's quoted. You want me to read it? I'll read it from his translation. Guys, click on my link, save the article. Let me repeat that again, Blue. Did you know that Q11 Melchizedek, this scroll found in Cave 11 in Qumran, in the Dead Sea area, produced by Jews before during the time of Christ, did you know they identified Melchizedek as the God of Psalm 82, verse 1? Because there it says, God, Elohim, judges the gods. They said the God who judges these evil gods is Melchizedek. They identified the evil gods as Belial, a name of Satan, and his evil angelic spirit creatures. So Melchizedek is the God who destroys these wicked gods. And they said that Melchizedek is the priest who makes atonement for the sins of God's people and forgives them of their sins and says that he returned to heaven, meaning he came from heaven and returned to heaven. That's all in this school produced by Jews before or during the time of Christ were not Christian. Did you know that? It's my article. I provide two English translations by two different groups of scholars. Now here's James Kugel's translation. Are you ready for me to read it? Are you ready for me to read it? You want me to read the entire section or just his translation? He's got a section on it. Do you want me to read the entire section so you can get the background or just okay, we'll read the arcade. The Emily Melchizedek. Now watch here. But interpreting Abraham's encounter with Melchizedek in the light of Psalm 110 led to other more radical conclusions okay after all the melchizedek described in the psalm seemed in some ways superhuman his royal scepter had come from god himself quote the lord sends forth from zion your mighty scepter unquote in fact melchizedek is apparently the lord referred to in the first line who is commanded by god to sit at my right hand like some sort of angel or divine being now watch this it is from this interpretation of Psalm 110 that there emerged the figure of a heavenly Melchizedek, an angelic being who sits next to the throne, the divine throne. Watch here. Such a Melchizedek is found in the Dead Sea Scrolls, where in a text going back to the early first or second century, Lord Jesus, loosen my tongue, going back to the first or second century before Christ, he is said to be ready to punish the guilty and save the righteous in the great day of reckoning. Are you now ready for me to read the translation? I don't know why you're talking about paraclete and spirit. It's about Melchizedek. Where'd you get paraclete spirit? Cloudy, where are you, man? Are you in La, La La Land? Okay, let's read. Melchizedek, this is the scroll now. This is the scroll. Melchizedek will carry out the vengeance of the laws of God on that day, and he will save them from Belial, that's the name of Satan, 
and from all his kindred spirits, and to his aid will come all the gods of justice. And the Melchizedek is the one who will stand on that day over all the sons of God and will ordain this, this assembly. This is the day of peace about which God spoke of old in the words of the prophet Isaiah, who said, how beautiful on the mountains are the messenger's feet proclaiming peace. Watch this. Let me read the rest of it. It may be that the interpretation of the name Melchizedek had a role in the understanding of this angel's precise functions. He is the king of justice in the sense that he will carry out the vengeance of God's laws. This understanding also corresponds to the Psalm's assertion that he will ex execute judgment among the nations, Psalm 110 verse 6. Some identified this angelic Melchizedek with the archangel Michael. Now, folks, folks, here are a group of Jews that took Psalm 82, Psalm 7, 7 Psalm chapter 7, verses 7 and 8, and Isaiah 52, 7, that speaks of God, Elohim, that speaks of Yahovah, Jehovah, and took those Old Testament passages and said, the God of Psalm 82, the Jehovah of Psalm 7, 78, the God of Isaiah 52, 7, all referred to Melchizedek. He is that God. He is that Jehovah who in the day of vengeance destroys Bilal and his evil spirit creatures. And he is the God that is the priest that makes atonement for the people of God, forgives their sins, and returns to heaven. These are not Christians. These are Jews writing before and during the time of Jesus. Where were they getting this from? They were getting it from the Old Testament because they were perplexed. They were baffled by what the Psalm said about Melchizedek and the honor given to Melchizedek by Abraham, their father. They were baffled. Now, other Jews weren't so baffled. Other Jews actually thought Melchizedek was none other than Shem, the son of Noah. So you'll find in the Targums and the Talmud, in the Talmud and the Targums, that Melchizedek was Shem, the son of Noah, who lived up until the time of Isaac, which is why Abraham submitted to him, because he knew this was his ancestor, Shem. You with me there? He knew this was his ancestor, Shem. Let me find it for you. Who, who, who did I put to sleep here? So not all Jews had the same view. So don't get me wrong. I'm not saying all Jews believe the same thing. What I'm saying is, right? Let me get it for you. And you can read these sources online for yourself. Right here. So some Jews thought it was Shem. Let me get it for you. Here you go. Cedar Olam. Cedar Olam 23. About Shem being a prophet, it says, upon my word, Melchizedek. So a Jewish source called, Jewish source called Cedar Olam says Melchizedek was Shem, the son of Noah. Another source. Targum Nifiti. Neofiti, Neofiti, Neofiti. Okay. Genesis 14, 18. And Melchizedek, the king of Jerusalem, who was the great Shem, the great Shem. And then you have other sources. Abod der Natan. Abod der Natan. A2. Likewise, Shem was born circumcised, as it says, and Melchizedek, king of Salem. So here, you had other Jewish sources that said Melchizedek was Shem, the son of Noah. And because he was just, he was called the king of justice. And he was ruling from Shalem. And Abraham recognized, hey, that's Shem, my ancestor. Everyone with me there? All of this is now the background for Hebrew 7. All of this is now the background for Hebrew 7. I had to give you all this foundation, all this background, all this detail, which means, Lord willing, when I do part two, you must listen to this again. You have to re-listen to this. Let it sink in. Go over it. Ask the Holy Spirit to help you understand it.
so that when I go into Hebrews 7 in depth, Lord willing, in the second part, you'll have this as a background. It'll make sense. So I'm going to whet your appetite. We're going to briefly look at Hebrews 7 verses 1 to 3 to prepare you for part 2. By the grace of the triune God. You got a lot of meat, folks. Re-listen to the session and the previous sessions. Tommy, no one's disagreeing with you. I'm not saying they're right. I'm just giving you the Jewish interpretations and how they were baffled. Re-listen to this session and other sessions. Upload them to your YouTube channels. Spread the links. Let other people benefit from these so they can see how deep, how amazing, how mind-blowing the Bible is because the God who is real, who's the author of this book, is infinitely deep and mind-blowing. Okay? So now... Let me whet your appetite for part two, God willing. Not today, folk, man, my friend. We've already been at it for almost two hours. Jesus Christ is the Lord. Even I need a break. Break. I'm human, right? Okay. Hebrews 7, verses 1 to 3. Okay. Hebrews 7, verses 1 to 3. Unfortunately, we say you won't get this at most churches. But instead of complaining, if it's a solid church that believes the Bible is God's word, they're Trinitarians, go serve there. Go serve there. Learn here, not just for me. Don't just learn for me, Luisa, because I'm not infallible and don't make me more than I am. Hear other voices. Trust the Holy Spirit to guide you. Seek the face of the Holy Spirit and ask him to guide you and show, me, show you where I'm wrong and help me to see why I'm wrong. And sanctify us for the glory of Jesus. And do pray for the ministers that are serving you the word and for their support. Like I said, without your support, we can't do this. Glory to the triune God. Now, Hebrews 7, verses 1 to 3. Hebrews 7, verses 1 to 3. Let's read it. He posted it. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, Shalem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham, Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all. First being, by interpretation, king of righteousness. Let me explain what that means, king of righteousness. And after that, also king of Salem, which is king of peace, without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, abideth the priest continually. Now let me show you what the author of Hebrews is doing. Melchizedek. Melchizedek. Mel Melchizedek is composed of two Hebrew words. Melchi. My king, Zedek, which can mean righteous or just. So he's saying even his name is significant. His name is king of righteousness, king of right of justice. And his other name, he's the king of Salem. And in Hebrew, it's Shalem. And Abdul Halaj can confirm. The Hebrew word is Shalem. It came, comes from the root word where we get Shalom, which means peace. So he is the king of righteousness. He is a just king. He is my king who is righteous. And he's the king of peace. Even the names are deliberately given to point to Jesus. Because let's read Hebrews 7 verse 3 one more time. Okay. Hebrews 7 verse 3 one more time. Without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, abideth the priest continually. So he's saying he is a deliberate picture of Jesus. So he's not Jesus. <clears throat> he is like Jesus. He's made to resemble Jesus. He's made to be a picture of Jesus, pointing to Jesus, a shadow of Jesus, the Son of God. You get it? So number one, he's not the son of God. He resembles the son of God. He's a picture of the son of God. He's a shadow of the son of God. He's made like the son of God because he's pointing to the son of God. How much more clearly does this have to be? Exactly. How much more clearly does this have to be? Thank you. You're learning how to write Hebrew. You with me there? So number one, he's not the son of God, but he resembles the son of God. How? 
Like the Son of God, he's the king of righteousness. Like the Son of God, he's the king of peace. Like the Son of God, he is a priest. And like the Son of God, he gave Abraham bread and wine. Like the Son of God gave his disciples bread and wine. Bread and wine that we are to observe till this day. You catching it? So is he literally eternal? Does he literally have no beginning? So he's an eternal person? No. That's not the point of Hebrews. So let me quickly whet your appetite for what's to come in part two, God willing. Even if you want to say, even if you want to say he is eternal, that Melchizedek is an eternal person, like Jesus is an eternal person. This doesn't prove there are four divine persons in the Godhead. Follow with me here. Even if someone wants to argue with me saying, no, no, see, he's eternal too. So you got four members of the Godhead, like some anti-Trinitarians foolishly say, right? That doesn't prove he's the fourth member of the Godhead. You know what this would prove? Let's assume Hebrews meant Melchizedek is an eternal person. He is eternal, like Jesus is. You know what this would prove? You ready? You know what this would prove? Tell me out, guys. What would this prove? So he's actually literally eternal. No, he's not a theophany because he's the priest of God most high, meaning he's the priest of God the Father. No, not pre-incarnation. It's not Jesus. He resembles the Son. The most you would prove is that this is the Holy Spirit. That's all you're proving. So even if Melchizedek was an actual eternal person, he's not the Son of God because it says he resembles him. He's not God the Father because he's the priest of, of God the Father. That means this would be a human appearance, a human manifestation of the Holy Spirit on earth. That's all you're proving. So you're proving it's still three divine persons and that Melchizedek is the human appearance of the Holy Spirit, if you were to take it literally. And after all, the Holy Spirit doesn't have a father, right? And he is eternal and he is righteous and he does intercede. Medic, you're still not getting it? Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Let's try this again. If someone says Melchizedek is actually eternal, it's literal. He literally doesn't have parents. Literally has no beginning and no end because he's literally eternal. Are you now telling me, Medic, there are four divine persons? There you go, what? I don't know what you guys are talking about. So then if it's not a fourth divine person, but he is literally eternal, uncreated, then which person of the Godhead would he be? Not the son, because he resembles the son. Not God the Father, because he's the priest of God the Father. So who are you left with? The Holy Spirit. You with me there? So... All you're proving is this is the Holy Spirit appearing in human form, a human manifestation of the Holy Spirit. And after all, the Holy Spirit is righteous. The Holy Spirit is peace. Peace comes from him. And he does intercede before God the Father. So he too performs priestly functions. So that's all you would prove. It's still three persons with the Holy Spirit being Melchizedek. But I'm not saying it is. No, you guys are not hearing me. See, on one mind, you're still not hearing me. Ugh, 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 ugh. Which part of, even if you insist that he's literally eternal, uncreated? Okay. If someone wants to nitpick and argue with me and saying, no, he is eternal. The language is plain, explicit. You're explaining it away. No, the language says he has no beginning. It's literal. You got to explain it away. So I'll go with that for argument's sake. All right, he is eternal and created. We still have a trinity. No, you don't. You have No, 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 no. Who told you? He's a fourth person. That's the Holy Spirit. All you've proven to me 
That's the Holy Spirit who appeared as a man, a human manifestation of the Holy Spirit on earth. So we're still with three persons, not four persons who are eternal. I'm simply assuming this for argument's sake. But that's not what Hebrews 7.3 is saying. Hebrews 7 is playing off the lack of details in Genesis. Because Genesis doesn't tell you when he was born, if he was born in Jerusalem, what's his ancestry and his lineage, were there priests before him, and doesn't mention his death. He appears mysteriously and vanishes mysteriously. So it's playing off the lack of details in Genesis to show that was deliberate. It was deliberately omitted. In other words, you know what Hebrews is telling you? God deliberately omitted those details. God deliberately didn't give us his ancestry. Deliberately left out the names of his parents and deliberately left out his death because God designed Melchizedek from the beginning to be a picture of a reality. He's not the reality. He's a shadow. And he's a shadow of the reality. The reality is Jesus. It's Jesus who is eternal. It's Jesus who is uncreated. It's Jesus who is beginningless. And it's Jesus who remains a priest forever. Melchizedek isn't any of those things. But he was designed in such a way to give you an impression that he is eternal. Because he's meant to point to the reality. And that reality, he is the eternal one. That's the point. So this is to whet your appetite for Lord willing part two. All right. So Lord willing, if God is pleased tomorrow, Sunday, it's the Lord's day. Obviously pray that the Lord will help me find a solid church because I'm church hopping the solid church that I can settle in. And guys do pray by the grace of God. Again, see, you guys almost made me forget, made me forget the links. Psalm 110. Remember? So I had to remember. Now let me give you, all you do to make it easy, you go to my blog, answeringislamblog.wordpress.com because there are too many articles. I have over half a dozen, I believe. You go on the search engine and you post Psalm 110, right? Okay? Just go to the search engine, Psalm 110 and answeringislamblog.wordpress.com and you're going to see over half a dozen articles on Psalm 110, where by the grace of the triune God, and I'm not lying, folks. I give you spiritually battle-tested arguments. These arguments we've used in the battlefield, in the spiritual battle with Orthodox Jews and liberals, and they are irrefutable by the grace of the triune God. If you study these articles, you can even have my permission to print them, use them in your Bible studies. Upload them to your website. Just leave the name and the URL intact. Don't sell them because if you sell them, I have to get all the proceeds. These arguments are irrefutable. I show irrefutable proof. David wrote Psalm 110, and he didn't write it about himself. He didn't write it about Solomon. He wrote it about Jesus the Messiah. And Psalm 110 proves that the Messiah has to be the God-man. Okay? So let me give you the link again. I can't post all the links. There are too many. This is a search engine I gave you. You'll see it's all there. I promise you, you have more than enough information to show how Psalm 110 is one of the strongest Old Testament proofs for the Messiah being the God-man and that in the Godhead, there are two persons, Father and Son, right? Folks, do pray for me. Weekends are kind of hard because Saturdays were the days I used to be with my daughters all day and put them asleep. And then Sundays, I take them to church. This has been taken away from me for, for two years. And good news, folks, just good news. God is doing something miraculous. By the grace of Jesus Christ, that other state can't come after me. God has worked in such a way where that previous state of mind has been shut off to me. They can't come to me, and I can't go to them. Which means that the Lord Jesus has to bring my daughters to me. But still, I need God to show up, pray for favor with the appellate court, a higher court, to see the corrupt decisions of that judge overturn them because if the appellate court overturns her it's over for the judge over for the lawyers and for my ex-wife and god will vindicate me and so any day now we can receive word from the appellate court to vindicate me by the power of the triune god but 
most importantly, folks, you're my family, and I open up to you as much as I can. Okay? I miss my daughters. When I was with them, I was content, and they miss me. I'm aching for them. Pray Jesus does a miracle because now I can't go there. They have to come here and live here. Pray God breaks their mother to repent and relocates. Pray God removes that man Martin from their lives and bring them to me because it's lonely without them. But Jesus has been sustaining me and he's been more than good to me. And I love my Lord Jesus. Pray he keeps me holy and not succumb to the flesh. Pray for the provisions to do ministry and take care of them. Because I'm in my own place until my brother gets here. And folks, pray that they come. Because as long as they're in my life, I'm content. Not having them with me, it, it's kind of lonely. And I'm content being single until Jesus calls me home. I'm not looking for a godly woman. But if God has one for me, his will be done. But I'm content to be the way I am. And folks, I truly love you, even though I love you imperfectly. Forgive me when I cause you to stumble. Forgive me for impatience. As long as you come, I'll serve you if Jesus wants me to serve you. Until he takes me home or descends. And may he descend sooner than later. Lord Jesus, come sooner than later. But we ask for this favor. Wash us in your blood. Seal us by your spirit. Flood us in your love. And flood my daughters, Lord Jesus. And keep us safe from the evil one. From this fallen world. From our own flesh. To walk in the power of your spirit. Because you are worthy. Increase in us. We love you, son of God. We love you, son of David. We love you, virgin-born son of Mary. You are risen, risen indeed. Maranatha. We love you, Father, Son, and Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. If I do a live stream tomorrow, look for me between 6 and 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. 6 and 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, which is New York time, and thank you for the support. Now, guys, I'm going to have to ask Protestant and first last how to then get that support from Super Chat. Although I've enabled it, I haven't hooked it up where now it can be transferred to my account. And pray for the mod, mods for helping me to help you. And thank the Lord for First Last and Protestant because they have access to my YouTube. They're beatifying it. They're making it professional. They're adding thumbnails. They're editing it for the glory of the triumph God. And they'll get paid by me. All right. Thank you, guys. Love you. And I hope you're blessed. Christ is risen. Risen forever and he'll never die. We love you, Lord Jesus. Amen.